So, warm welcome to the Gita Sandesh program. Today's chapter is a very interesting chapter called Dhyana Yoga. But uh, before we look at chapter 6, let us see what has transpired so far in chapter 5. We begin with a little pastime. <clears throat> in chapter 3, when Krishna is talking about how one has to perform one's prescribed duties and responsibilities to maintain individual order, to maintain social order, to, co to maintain cosmic order, uh, to lead by example. <clears throat> he mentions Janak Maharaj. So Janak Maharaj is the father of Sita Devi. And He is known to have achieved perfection by doing his prescribed duties. As I mentioned, he is one of the 12 Mahajans that's mentioned in the Srimad Bhagavatam. <clears throat> A Mahajan is somebody who exemplifies perfect conduct. And uh, we can easily follow a Mahajan's instructions because of the perfections that they have achieved on the path of self-realization. So Janak Maharaj was a great devotee of the Lord. But he was, he was also a great king. So of course, every king is surrounded by rishis and sages who will come frequently <clears throat> to share their knowledge and wisdom from the scriptures with the king so that the king has the necessary tools from the scriptures, from the knowledge that's present in the scriptures and from the knowledge of the self-realized souls to provide good governance for their citizens. Now, in Janak Maharaj's kingdom, similarly, there were great rishis and sages. <clears throat> These sages knew that Janak Maharaj was a great devotee, but he was also a great king. A king is not an ordinary role. You have the weight of managing a kingdom. You have the weight of making sure that all of your citizens are pleased and happy. You're carrying that weight on your shoulders. So your duty is not just to lead a luxurious life at the expense of the taxpayers. Your duty really is to provide good governance and make sure that everybody is happy and pleased, that everybody is prosperous in your kingdom. So these sages could not understand how Janaka Maharaj managed to do both. Remember, that is Arjuna's question. Should I renounce or should I work in devotion? That's how chapter five started. And Lord Krishna's response to him was, working in devotion to me is renunciation. So Krishna simply combined the two questions together and gave one answer. Working for Krishna is renunciation. So these sages could not understand how Janaka Maharaj could have so much devotion towards the Lord and at the same time perform his duties and responsibilities to his kingdom in a perfect fashion. Because they thought, we've renounced everything. 
and uh, we are struggling with our renunciation. How is it somebody who is a grahastha and has so many duties and responsibilities and has so many pressures from different directions and conflicting situations that he has to resolve all the time, how is he able to manage this so sublimely? So they approach Janaka Maharaj and ask him this question. My dear king, we are all sages. We have renounced all worldly things. Yet we have challenges managing our mind, managing our thoughts. How do you do it? That was the question. And they tell him, actually, we don't think it's possible. Therefore, we wanted to ask you how you actually do it. Janak Maharaj responds by saying, it is possible. Which means it is possible to do your work faithfully as per the instructions of the Acharya. And also be a devotee of the Lord. You don't have to give up your work to become a devotee of the Lord. That's not the philosophy of the Bhagavad Gita at all. Not to give up your work. So Janak Maharaj says, I'll explain to you, why don't you come tomorrow? I have a wonderful feast planned. So the next day, the sages and rishis arrive. And they notice, of course, they are great self-realized souls. So Janak Maharaj washes all their feet, seats them down, and he has served out banana leaves in front of them. And he's ready to serve them prashadam. They were anxious to get the answer. They were anxious to know what is the trick of the trade here? How can you completely surrender to the Lord and also simultaneously do your duties and responsibilities to family, to society, and have time for the Lord? So Janak Maharaj said, I'll answer your question. Why don't you just enjoy your prashadam for now? And the king personally begins to serve them. And the sages are all seated in one straight line next to each other. And when the king begins to serve them prasad, <coughs> they're obviously looking up at the king. And what do they see? Over each of their heads, a very sharp sword is dangling on a thin piece of thread. So as many sages that were seated in a row, ready to honor Prashadam, each one of them had a sword directly over their head. Now, even though they were sages, they got nervous. And they looked with wide eyes at the king. Say, are we your guests? Or what are you planning to do? Why are the swords dangling over each of our heads? And Janak Maharaj said, relax. Nothing will happen. Just enjoy your prashadam. And by the way, I still have the answer to your question. So I'll give you that answer shortly. So, the sages ate their prasadam in a hurry because none of them wanted to be sitting under that sword. They really loved Janaka Maharaj. They trusted him. But still, they were in a hurry to get up and go wash their hands. <clears throat> so all of them have finished their prasadam. They wash their hands and they're seated in a different place now. And uh, Janak Maharaj asks them a question. They were anxious to hear the answer, but in return, the king had a question for the sages. His question was, tell me, what were you thinking when you were sitting there and having a prashadam? And all of them said the same thing. 
the only thing we could think about was the sword dangling over our head. Yes, you reassured us that nothing will be happened, that we are in safe hands. But we couldn't concentrate on enjoying the prasadam. Our mind was preoccupied with the sword. <clears throat> So Janak Maharaj said, just like you were honoring prasadam, but at the same time, your mind was focused on the sword. So too, I perform my duties and responsibilities, but in the back of my mind, I'm always thinking about my Supreme Father. So to do the two is possible. To be immersed in your day-to-day -day responsibilities, but in your mind, in your heart, to always be thinking of Krishna, Janak Maharaj said, it's possible. Why is it possible? Because the sages, while they were honoring their prasadam, they were thinking about the soul. Their mind was preoccupied with something else. So similarly, Janak Maharaj said, my mind is always preoccupied with thoughts of the Lord. Even though I have to solve so many conflicts, uh, so many diplomatic issues crop up. Wars have to be fought. Citizens' complaints have to be handled. But because I'm always thinking of Krishna, I'm able to do both simultaneously. So similarly, Krishna is saying in chapter 5, you can do both. You can take good care of your family. You can manage your day-to-day -day duties and responsibilities and also practice Krishna consciousness. You can do both. And Krishna says that person who has learned to do both is better than a sannyasi holding a danda in his hand. Do you know why? Because to have that burden of taking care of family and living a grahastha life and still having time for Krishna. Krishna says they are the greatest sannyasis. Therefore, Arjuna, get up and fight. Don't abandon your duties and responsibilities thinking that abandoning them is going to put you in a better place. So this whole chapter 5 begins with Arjuna asking. On the one hand, you are asking me to renounce actions. On the other hand, you are asking me to work for you. Why does it seem like your instructions to me are a little contradictory? It should be one or the other, isn't it? You are saying renunciation leads to liberation. You are saying working with devotion for you leads to liberation. Then why can't I choose one over the other? So Krishna says that's because. Yes, Krishna says becoming a sannyasi, renouncing all material things, renouncing all actions and activities puts you on the path of liberation. But working for me with love and devotion also puts you on the path of liberation. But working for me with love and affection and devotion is like being on that bullet train. You'll reach me much faster. So selflessly working for Krishna, Krishna says, is superior to renouncing all actions and becoming a Tyagi. <clears throat> so the reason Arjuna actually gets confused is because in uh, Shloka 41 of chapter 4, in the very same Shloka, we can look at that Shloka quickly. <clears throat> we'll go to chapter 4. And go to the shloka where the Lord seems to have given Arjuna contradictory instructions in the same shloka. Which is 40, shlokas 41 and 42. So 
So in chapter 4, Krishna is saying in Shloka 41, one who acts in devotional service, renouncing the fruits of his actions and whose doubts have been destroyed by transcendental knowledge, is situated factually in the self. Thus, he is not bound by the reactions of work, or conqueror of riches. Therefore, the doubts which have arisen in your heart out of ignorance should be slashed by the weapon of knowledge. So, on the one hand, Krishna is saying, renounce actions. On the other hand, he is saying, stand up and fight. So that was the confusion for Arjuna. Why are you giving me contradictory instruction? Therefore, Arjuna becomes bewildered again. So what does Arjuna actually think? He thinks that, uh, that jnana means to give up all material activities. But at the same time here in chapter 5, Krishna is saying that working in devotion for him is superior. So the confusion for Arjuna is, should I stop working or should I start working? Because on the one hand, Krishna is saying stop working. So that also gives you liberation. On the other hand, he's saying start working. So which is it? So like this, <clears throat> Krishna handles the question by saying both are capable of giving you liberation, but one is superior to the other and preferred by me. And what is preferred by the Lord is that we don't abandon our situation in life, but rather uh, manage it to the best of our ability, even though uh, being in that same situation may put you in a lot of uh, disturbances or create a lot of stress and anxiety. So in shlokas 7 to 12, Krishna talks about yoga yukta, which is a person practicing nishkama karma yoga, which is you are attached to your duties, but you are detached from the results. And in this process, the Lord also talks about how this person uh, behaves, what are his characteristics? He says such a person does not get entangled. He is aloof from the sense objects. He is unaffected by sinful reaction. And in that context, the Lord talks about how uh, such a person is like that lotus leaf, leaf, which is untouched by water. The water just floats around like a globule on the leaf. So the leaf of the lotus does not get wet, even though water is on it. So Krishna is saying, that's how a self-realized person is. Um, <clears throat> so how a person attached versus a person detached, what are the results? That Krishna talks about in Shloka 12. The steadily devoted soul attains unadulterated peace because he offers the results of all activities to me. Whereas a person who is not in union with the divine, who is greedy for the fruits of his labor, becomes entangled. So Krishna is giving you an instruction here. Whatever results that you get by working for Krishna, you have to offer it to Krishna first. Whatever it is. If you buy a new phone, offer it to Krishna before you use it. Buy a new car, offer it to Krishna before you use it. Buy a new house, offer it to Krishna before you use it. Have a new baby, offer the baby to Krishna so that the baby may also be practicing Krishna conscious. Of course, perform all of the relevant samskaras. The same sentence the Lord is saying, those people who are not united with me and they're just greedy for results, they become entangled, meaning they get caught up in the cycle of karma. And in the next shloka, the Lord is giving an indication of what's the result of a person who is in control. When the embodied living being controls his nature and mentally renounces all actions, 
he resides happily in the city of nine gates. We are the city of nine gates. Two eyes, two ears, two nostrils, one mouth, and two evacuating organs. Total nine. So we have nine gates in our body. So the Lord is saying when the embodied living being controls his nature, and mentally renounces all actions. He resides happily in the city of nine gates, neither working nor causing work to be done. When the Lord says neither working, he doesn't mean that person is sitting idle, sleeping under a tree. No, he is working, but he's not working. He's working, but in the eyes of the Lord, he's not working for karmic reactions. He's working in an action, which means a karma. And then we discussed how the Lord talks about the three different doers, the Atma desires, the Paramatma sanctions, and Prakriti executes the Lord's order. So in this triangle, who is the culprit? The culprit is the person with the desire, the material desire. So it is the living entity's desire that is responsible for what happens to him in his life. The Lord is not responsible. Prakriti is not responsible. The Lord is simply sanctioning what you have expressed as a desire. And sometimes the Lord may not sanction. So we, talk, we saw two diagrams. If the Lord sanctions, you become happy and then you want more. If the Lord doesn't sanction, you become unhappy and you get angry with God. Or whoever else. So, in Shloka 16, Krishna is saying, those who understand this triangle, Jivatma, Paramatma, Prakriti triangle, and how it is actually operating, they actually are in knowledge. When, however, one is enlightened with the knowledge by which nascience is destroyed, nascience means ignorance of darkness, then his knowledge reveals everything. As the sun lights up everything, in the daytime. So this transcendental knowledge removes ignorance from you. <clears throat> and what happens when your ignorance is removed? When one's intelligence, mind, faith and refuge are all fixed in the Supreme, then one becomes fully cleansed of misgivings through complete knowledge and thus proceeds straight on the path of liberation. And what happens to such a person who sees with this Jnana Chakshu, divine eyes? The humble sages, by virtue of true knowledge, see with equal vision a learned and gentle Brahmana, a cow, an elephant, a dog, and a dog eater. In the fourth chapter, Krishna has already said, a self-realized soul recognizes that all jivatmas belong to me. They are mine. And here the Lord is repeating that, that by virtue of their knowledge, such a humble sage sees everybody's body as a temple occupied by the Supreme Lord in his Paramatma form. Therefore, they do not discriminate. And what is the Lord saying? Such a person they have already conquered the conditions of birth and death. They are flawless like Brahman. And thus they are already situated in Brahman. So this way, the Lord talks about the symptoms of the self-realized soul um, in these particular shlokas. So from 22 to 25, Krishna talks about 
then why do some people seem to be stuck in miserable conditions? Krishna says that's because an intelligent person does not take part in the sources of misery, which are due to contact with the material senses. O son of Kunti, such pleasures have a beginning and an end. So the wise man does not delight in them. So Krishna is saying a wise person knows that a material desire has a start date and an end date. It's our desires, one single desire if it is satisfied, it is not everlasting. It just gives birth to another desire and that desire gives birth to another desire and the cycle goes on. And Krishna is saying, before giving up this present body, if one is able to tolerate the urges of the material senses and check the force of desire and anger, he is well situated and is happy in the world. Krishna is telling you what is the solution. The first solution is tolerate. Your mind will say a lot of things, give you a lot of suggestions. Desires will be flowing inside you. You will be angry when things don't go your way. What is Krishna's advice for us? Tolerate. The solution is to tolerate. So the source of misery is sense gratification. But what should we tolerate? We should tolerate all the different urges. Anger, hatred, envy, desire, lust, anxiety, stress. Okay? How long we should tolerate? Before giving up this present body. Until you die, you have to learn to tolerate <laughs> all this. Krishna saying there will be ups and downs. You don't have a choice. You better learn to tolerate now because you will see the seesaw in your life until you die. So, <clears throat> so till our last breath, Krishna is saying we have to tolerate our senses. We have to tolerate our mind. It's going to drag us in different directions. But we need to be steadfast that we will work for Krishna. We will uh, develop our love for Krishna. And we will serve Krishna. That's what Krishna means here. A lot of other interruptions will happen in the outer world. Your inner world must be fixed in Krishna. Until you die. And how is Krishna proving it in the next shloka? One whose happiness is within who is active and rejoices within and whose aim is inward is actually the perfect mystic. He is liberated in the Supreme and ultimately he attains the Supreme. So the entire Bhagavad Gita is how to find that happiness within yourself, not in somebody else, not in something else. Because happiness does not reside outside you, Krishna is saying. Happiness resides within you. That happiness is derived when you are connected to Krishna. So one whose happiness is within, who is active, which means such a person who is happy is not sitting somewhere under a tree. They are active doing all their duties and responsibilities very nicely. But because their sadhana is so perfect, they are experiencing a great deal of joy. They are trying to become better human beings. And therefore the Lord is saying, because this is an inward journey, such a person is the perfect mystic. He is liberated in the Supreme and ultimately he attains the Supreme. So this entire thing is about self-management. Managing yourself first. That's why it's called self-realization. Of course, self-realization is faster through God-realization. 
the two go hand in hand. So when you learn to tolerate, you will no longer see dualities. Dualities come because of doubts. Could it be this or could it be that? Is this one better or that one better? Whose minds are engaged within, who are always busy working for the welfare of all living beings and who are free from all sins, achieve liberation. How are you working for the welfare of all living beings? You are taking this knowledge to other Jivatmas and connecting them to Krishna. That's the highest social welfare work you can do. Srila Prabhupada calls this spiritual communism. Everybody should be Krishna conscious when the world will be perfect. Those who are free from anger and all material desires, who are self-realized, self-disciplined, and constantly endeavoring for perfection, are assured of liberation in the Supreme in the very near future. So Krishna is talking about self-discipline and perfection. In the most mundane of activities that you are doing, Krishna expects you to do it with perfection. If you're cooking, cook with perfection. If you're making a garland for Krishna, do it with perfection. If you're waking up early for Krishna, be self-disciplined. Do it with perfection. Every single activity that we do in our life, Krishna expects you to do it with self-discipline, and always endeavoring to do better than yesterday. So Krishna expects you to push yourself forward. That's what he wants. To push yourself forward on this path of bhakti. And this shloka sets the stage for today's chapter. <clears throat> In shlokas 27 and 28, Krishna talks about Dhyana Yoga, which is how you can meditate and go within. Remember Krishna has said this is a journey within. And Krishna is going to say one journey within is to be connected to him. The other way to journey within is by practicing, practicing Ashtanga Yoga, which is the essence of today's chapter. So Krishna says shutting out all external sense objects, keeping the eyes and vision concentrated between the two eyebrows, Suspending the inward and outer breaths within the nostrils and thus controlling the mind, senses and intelligence. The transcendentalist aiming at liberation becomes free from desire, fear and anger. One who is always in this state is certainly liberated. And then we talked about the peace formula. A person in full consciousness of me knowing me to be the ultimate beneficiary of all sacrifices and austerities, the supreme lord of all planets and demigods, and the benefactor and well-wisher of all living entities, attains peace, peace from the pangs of material physics. So that brings us to chapter 6. So chapter 6 is Dhyan Yoga. Dhyana Yoga, introduced briefly in the previous chapter in Shrokas 27 and 28. So let's look at the summary. We said in the first chapter, Arjuna was lamenting. In the second chapter, the Lord has to establish his real identity as the spirit soul. In the third chapter, Krishna gives him his job description. What is his first job description? Work for me. Work for Vishnu. That's your first duty. That's the duty that's most important. Okay, if I want to work for Vishnu, in what mood should I do it? What knowledge do I need to have about Vishnu? That's given in the fourth chapter. Okay, what's so great about working for Vishnu? Why should I work for Vishnu? Why should I not work for myself? 
Well, if you work for Vishnu, the result is peace, inner peace. And one other way of achieving this inner peace is covered in today's chapter. So today's chapter is all about meditation. It's all about controlling the mind. So what you should think of, you should think of Vishnu all the time. That's the essence of today's chapter. It sets the stage for the next six chapters, which is Bhakti Yoga. Let's offer our humble obeisances to His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhakti Vedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. So, Krishna is continuing from the previous chapter. So there are no questions in the beginning of this chapter, although there are very important questions that Arjuna asks towards the middle of the chapter. So we'll come to those questions soon. The question is that Arjuna has not asked, but Krishna is responding. Is our mind our enemy or our friend? And what is this whole Ashtanga Yoga about? So from chapter Shriokas 10 to 36, Krishna details the prerequisites for practicing Ashtanga Yoga. And then Arjuna has a very interesting question. He says, Krishna, you've spoken to me about different people following different paths. Some are jnanis, some are dhyanis, some are karmi yogis, some are bhaktas. What if we try very hard and we don't succeed in this life, is that all a waste of time and effort and energy? That's Arjuna's question. Okay, I've heard you. I've decided to follow your instruction. But what if before I die, I'm not successful? What if I don't reach that spiritual objective goal? What happens to me? Do I have to start all over in the next life? And Krishna gives a very interesting answer to that question. So who is actually a yogi? Now Krishna has talked about a jnana yogi, karma yogi, dhyana yogi, and a bhakta. And Krishna is going to establish the superiority of his bhakta once and for all in this chapter. In a very large shloka. <clears throat> so today's acronym is easy. Actually, Ashtanga Yoga is not easy at all. But the acronym is easy. Success or failure, and uh, who is a genuine yogi. So, in the sixth shloka, let's see how chapter six actually begins. It's actually a continuation from chapter five. The theme is the same renunciation or work in devotion. So, the Lord speaks one who is unattached to the fruits of his work and who works as he is obligated is in the renounced order of life, and he is the true mystic. Not he who lights no fire and performs no duty. So Krishna is saying work. But don't be attached to the results. And at the same time, don't avoid doing your duty. Krishna is saying you are as good as a renounced person. And Krishna is saying what is called renunciation you should know to be the same as yoga or linking oneself to the supreme. For one can never become a yogi unless he renounces the desire for sense gratification. So to be considered a yogi, you have to give up your material desires. And from here, Krishna talks about Ashtanga Yoga. The difference between a person who is new to this path of Ashtanga Yoga versus a person who has been practicing it for many years and perhaps many lifetimes. And Krishna is going to talk about the different stages that one undergoes on this path of Ashtanga Yoga. So, Bhanduratma Atmanastasya Yenatmai Vatmana Jitaha Anatmana Stuta Shatrutve Varte Tatmai Vashatruvat. So, Krishna is saying for him who has conquered the mind, the mind is the best of friends. But for one who has failed to do so, his mind will remain the greatest enemy. Krishna is establishing the importance of how to manage one's mind. Because your mind 
can really create a lot of stress for you. If you don't monitor your mind, you have to do two things. You have to monitor your mind and mentor your mind. So you have to be detached from your mind in order to monitor it and mentor it and put it in the right direction. When is our mind our friend? When it learns to follow your instructions, it makes progressive and healthy choices. It becomes detached from unnecessary sense gratification. And the result that you get is freedom from anxiety and elevation in consciousness. When does your mind become your enemy? When your mind tempts you all the time, hey, why don't you go out and eat here? Why don't you go watch that movie? Why don't you go to this party? Why don't you hang out in that bar? All your friends are there. So when your mind is constantly directing you towards things that take you away from Krishna, then you're engaging in sinful activity. And what happens? Ultimately, you become irritated, agitated, and delusioned, misguided. You become so attached to sense gratification because everybody else is doing it, and you feel, why should I miss out? You know, all of us want to feel that sense of belonging. Others are going to the bar. If they are going to the bar, I should also go to the bar. Otherwise, they'll start thinking I'm strange. I don't want to be the odd man out. This is how the mind deceives you. What is the result? Entanglement and degradation in consciousness. So, <clears throat> our scriptures use this analogy of a chariot to say that the five horses are like the five senses. The reins are like the mind. The intelligence is like the driver. And the soul is like the passengers just sitting. The entire body of the chariot is like our physical body. So if the senses are not under control by the mind and if the mind is not controlled by the intelligence, then we can see five horses going in different directions. So what is yoga? Uh, is it just a physical exercise? Is it some kind of paranormal thing? Is it severe austerity? Is it just basically being able to perform all kinds of intricate asanas? What is Ashtanga yoga? Krishna defines it from 10 to 36. But of course, today you get advertisements for all kinds of yoga. Baby yoga, chair yoga, BP yoga. Uh, Krishna doesn't mention any of this in the Bhagavad Gita. Yoga is a serious business. So Krishna mentions these eight paths for yoga. It begins with yam and niyam. External discipline. Then it moves to internal discipline. Then you do your asanas. Then you learn pranayam. Then you practice pratyahara, which is withdrawing your senses from the outer world. Then you do dharana. Dharana on whom? You are concentrating on two things. First you are concentrating on the atma. Then you will concentrate on karma. So dhyana means you become go deep into meditation until you unite with the Supreme Lord himself that is called Samadhi. So these first five steps are for neophytes. Yam, Niyam, Asan, Pranayam, Pratyahara. These last three steps are people who are really advanced on the path of Ashtanga Yoga. So this first five steps Krishna calls it Yoga Rurukshuhu means a beginner. The last three stages, Krishna refers to it as Yoga Rudhara. Someone who is advanced in practicing meditation. So these are the eight limbs. Ashta Anga. Eight limbs of the yogic process. So you can see the shlokas aligned with these various eight limbs. Do's and don'ts sitting postures, how to breathe, how to withdraw the senses, how to control the mind, how to meditate on Vishnu, and how to go into complete samadhi. In union 
with Lord Vishnu. It's a very interesting set of shlokas if you read it. So if you look at the shlokas. <clears throat> So, how do you begin your practice of yoga? You should live alone in a secluded place. You should always control the mind. You should be free from desires and feelings of possessiveness. This belongs to me, that belongs to me, that person is mine. No, you have to give up all of this to begin practicing yoga. So, to practice yoga, Krishna says, one should go to a secluded place and should lay kusha grass on the ground and then cover it with a deer skin and a soft cloth. The seat should be neither too high nor too low and, be sh and should be situated in a sacred place. The yogi should then sit on it very firmly and practice yoga to purify the heart by controlling his mind, senses and activities and fixing the mind on one point. One should hold one's body, neck and head erect in a straight line and stare steadily at the tip of the nose. Thus, with an unagitated, subdued mind, devoid of fear, completely free from sex life, one should meditate upon me within the heart and make me the ultimate goal of life. Thus, practicing constant control of the body, mind and activities, the mystic transcendentalist, his mind regulated, attains to the kingdom of God or the abode of Krishna by cessation of material existence. There is no possibility of one's becoming a yogi or arjuna if one eats too much or eats too little, sleeps too much or does not sleep enough. He who is regulated in his happy habits of eating, sleeping, recreation and work can mitigate all material pains by practicing the yoga system. When the yogi, by practice of yoga, disciplines his mental activities and becomes situated in transcendence, devoid of all material desires, he is, he is said to be well established in yoga. As a lamp in a windless place does not waver, so the transcendentalist whose mind is controlled remains always steady in his meditation on the transcendental self. In the stage of perfection called trance or samadhi, one's mind is completely restrained from material mental activities by practice of yoga. This perfection is characterized by one's ability to see the self by the pure mind and to relish and rejoice in the self. In that joyous state, one is situated in boundless transcendental happiness, realized through transcendental senses. Established thus, one never departs from the truth, and upon gaining this, he thinks there is no greater gain. Being situated in such a position, one is never shaken, even in the midst of greatest difficulty, this indeed is actual freedom from all miseries arising from material contact. One should engage oneself in the practice of yoga with determination and faith and not be deviated from the path. One should abandon without exception all material desires born of mental speculation and thus control all the senses on all sides by the mind. Gradually, step by step, one should become situated in trance by means of intelligence sustained by full conviction. And thus, the mind should be fixed on the self alone and should think of nothing else. From wherever the mind wanders due to its flickering and unsteady nature, one must certainly withdraw it and bring it back under the control of the self. The yogi whose mind is fixed on me verily attains the highest perfection of transcendental happiness. He is beyond the mode of passion. He realizes his qualitative identity with the Supreme and thus he is freed from all reactions to past deeds.
Thus, the self-controlled yogi, constantly engaged in yoga practice, becomes free from all material contamination and achieves the highest stage of perfect happiness in transcendental loving service to the Lord. The Lord is repeating what he said in Shloka 5, in chapter 5. A true yogi observes me in all beings and also sees every being in me. Indeed, the self-realized person sees me, the same Supreme Lord, everywhere. For one who sees me everywhere and sees everything in me, I am never lost, nor is he ever lost to me. Such a yogi who engages in the worshipful service of the super soul, knowing that I and the super soul are one, remains always in me in all circumstances. He is a perfect yogi who by comparison to his own self sees the true equality of all beings in both their happiness and their distress. Oh, Arjuna. And then Arjuna protests. He's been listening quietly. Now he's a little bit concerned. He says, Oh, Madhusudana, the system of yoga which you have summarized appears impractical and unendurable to me, for the mind is restless and unsteady. Krishna is telling Krishna, you are expecting me to do all of this. It sounds really unreasonable. Who can do this kind of Ashtanga Yoga? I can't do it. Why? The mind is restless, turbulent, obstinate and very strong, O Krishna. And to subdue it, I think, is more difficult than controlling the wind. So Arjuna has not asked a question, but he is protesting the path that the Lord has enumerated so far. So who can do this yoga? Our mind should not be agitated. We should not have any material desires. We should be practicing celibacy. Our mind should be like that lamp in a windless place, not going hither, thither, and all our habits, eating, sleeping, mating, defending, our work, our recreation, all of that has to be regulated. That's how strict we must be. And therefore, Arjuna is saying, hey, this is an impossible mission. I can't do this. Arjuna is saying, my mind, I forget it. So this very famous shloka, Chanchalam Himanak Krishna Pramate Balabhadhradam Tasyaham Nigraham Manye Vayor Ivasudoshkaram So my mind, Arjuna is saying, Krishna, I can't handle my mind. It's impossible. And this whole Dhyana Yoga is about mind control. Hmm. So what to do? It's just the nature of the mind. It goes here and there. It raises doubts because you have attachments. Is this better or that better? And then it begins to rationalize things. It rationalizes why you are attached to something. It's okay. You are attached. It is obstinate. It is strong. And once your mind gets fixated on a thought, it can't seem to let go. Especially if you are insulted, you are constantly thinking, how dare this person insult me? And not able to forget what that person has said for weeks and weeks and many weeks. You lose sleep. You are wondering how to get revenge, but you don't know how to do it properly. So the problem with the mind is, it does not ask for your permission before it does anything. It just drags you along in whichever direction. So how does Krishna respond when Arjuna protests and said, I don't think I can control the wind. Ask me to control the wind, I will be very successful. But my mind, not possible. And Krishna's response is, Shri Bhagavan Vacha Asamshayam Mahabaho Mano Durnigraham Chalam Abhyasena Tukanteya Krishna is saying, first of all, you see how Krishna is praising Arjuna. How is he referring to Arjuna? Asamshayam Mahabaho. Mahabaho, O oh mighty aunt. It is undoubtedly very dis difficult to curb the restless mind, but it is possible by suitable practice and by detachment. Abhyasena, Krishna says, you must practice. That's why he said, if your mind pulls you away, drag it back. Pull it back to where it needs to be. 
vairagyena by practicing detachment to objects and things and people. If your mind thinks that person belongs to me, this object belongs to me, then it's going to be very difficult to control the mind. So become detached. So abhyasena vairagyena. So how can you and I practice mind control? Because we definitely, definitely can't go to the forest and sit on the kusha grass and deer skin and all of that. It's very difficult to do all these things in city life. Secondly, it's not recommended in Kali Yuga to do Dhyana Yuga. Very difficult. So for those who are on the path of Bhakti Yoga, how do you control the mind? Through the process of Bhakti. There are nine limbs of Bhakti that Prahlad Maharaj instructs the other kids in the school when his teachers step away. Shravanam Kirtanam Vishnu Smaranam Archanam Vandanam Dasyam Pada Sevanam and then Atmani Vedanam. So you can practice any one of these nine limbs of bhakti or you can practice all nine. Even if you achieve perfection in one of them, Srila Prabhupada says you will achieve perfection in this life. So the do's are Shravanam Kirtanam. Shravanam here. Kirtanam Vishnu. Chant the holy names of the Lord. The first two limbs alone will get you um, to get to that perfection. Detachment, Vairagyena. How do you detach from your mind when any activity not engaged in the Lord's activity? You should become detached. The mind should become detached from it. It doesn't mean you should not perform it if it's your duty and responsibility. You should not vest too much interest in it. So then Arjuna asks one more question. Okay, so what if I try all of this that you've said? And what if I'm not successful in one life? Is all the effort that I put in, is that all a waste of time? That is Arjuna's question. His question is, what happens to those yogis who could not become successful? And Krishna's response is, Prapya punya kritam lokan usitva shashvati samaha shuchinam shrimatam gehe yogo brashto bhiyayate. Krishna is saying the unsuccessful yogi, after many, many years of enjoyment on the planets of the pious living entities, is born into a family of righteous people or into a family of rich aristocracy. So if you've practiced any of the transcendental paths, not just Dhyana Yoga, any one of the yogic paths, but for a short time, Krishna says, you would have accumulated some pious results because of those pious results that you've accumulated. He will send you to the heavenly planets where you can enjoy your sleep. When you're, once your pious results are exhausted, you'll come back into the middle planetary systems, take birth. And Krishna is saying, I will give you birth either in a in a family of pious people who know right from wrong, therefore you can continue from your past life. Or I will give you birth in a very rich family so that you don't have to worry about livelihood, etc. You can immediately focus on spirituality. Okay? So those who have practiced for a short period of time. <clears throat> and then there is one more shloka where the Lord talks about those who have practiced it for many, many years or many, many lifetimes, what happens to them. So that's the shloka. If the yogi is unsuccessful after a very, very lengthy practice, Krishna says he takes birth in a family of transcendentalists who are surely great in wisdom. Certainly such a birth is rare in the world. So if you've practiced bhakti before, Krishna says you will take birth in a family of bhaktas. Therefore, from a very young age, from your birth itself, you will be, be a devotee. But then Krishna is also telling you such a birth is very rare. 
if you are born into a family of devotees of Krishna, Krishna is saying such birth is very rare. But what happens after you take birth in a family of uh, devotees of Krishna? On taking such a birth, he revives the divine consciousness of his previous life and he again tries to make further progress in order to achieve complete success. By virtue of the divine consciousness of his previous life, he automatically becomes attracted to the yogic principles even without seeking them. Such an inquisitive transcendental stands always above the ritualistic principles of the scriptures. And when the yogi engages himself with sincere endeavor in making further progress, being washed of all contaminations, then ultimately achieving perfection after many, many births of practice, he attains the supreme goal. Which brings us to the last two shlokas where the Lord now compares the different transcendentalists he's been talking about from chapter 2. A yogi is greater than the ascetic, greater than the empiricist, and greater than the fruitive worker. Therefore, O Arjuna, in all circumstances be a yogi. So Krishna is saying someone who is practicing Ashtanga Yoga is better than a tapasvi, is better than a jnana yogi, is better than a karmakandi. So he's comparing four different types of individuals pursuing four different paths. All on the path ultimately leading to Krishna, but the goals are different. The rewards are different. So a dhyana yogi is better than a tapasvi. He is better than an empiricist. Empiricist means somebody who studies the Vedic scriptures. And he is also better than a karma kind. And what is Krishna saying? In all circumstances, be a yogi. Among these four yogis, you practice dhyana yoga. That's the best. But then, there's one more shloka. And of all yogis, the one with great faith who always abides in me, thinks of me within himself and renders transcendental loving service to me, he is the most intimately united with me in yoga and is the highest of all. That is my opinion. So Krishna, after comparing the dhyana yogi to the other types of transcendentalists, concludes this first section of the Bhagavad Gita, which is the first six chapters, by telling Arjuna that that yogi who is a bhakta, who is not only always thinking of him, but is always working for him with love. Krishna is saying that person has the greatest intimacy with me in yoga. And he is highest of all, which means you, you take any category you want, Krishna says, my bhakta is the topmost. That is my opinion. So, this is the yoga ladder. So, karma yogi is here, jnana yogi is here, dhyana yogi is here. And the topmost, Krishna says, is his bhakta. All of them are on the same ladder. They are just on different rungs. At the topmost rung is Krishna's duties. So, that is the Lord's Conclusion. So the last shloka is Yogi Nama Pisarvesham Matkate Nantaratmana Shraddhavan Bhajate Yomam Same Yuktattamo Mataha Shraddhavan Bhajate Yomam They are always serving me with love, with devotion. The Madgate Nantaratmana, they are always thinking of me. And therefore, Krishna says, his devotees are the greatest. And that sets the stage for the next six chapters, which is called Bhakti Yoga. And Bhakti Yoga, the middle six chapters, 
the Lord is going to shift the focus from Atma to Paramatma and Bhagavan. So in the next six chapters, the Lord is primarily going to talk about himself. He's spoken about the Jivatma so far, the problems that we have, the different ways we can try to achieve him, the challenges that we face, how to overcome those challenges. Now the middle six chapters, the Krishna is going to talk about his greatness and why he's so great. We will discover tomorrow in the seventh chapter where the seventh chapter talks about knowledge about the Supreme Lord. So to revise, the first chapter, single word summary is lamentation. The second chapter is identity. The third chapter is duty or your job responsibilities or your JD. The fourth chapter is knowledge. The fifth chapter is the result, which is peace. The sixth chapter ends with Krishna saying, always think of me because that's what my devotees do. And because he has ended with always thinking of me, he now has to talk about who is this me. So this entire middle six chapters from 7 to 12 is about the Supreme Lord. But of course, when the Lord is talking about himself, he automatically talks about his devotees. So the middle six chapter is about his bhaktas who are performing bhakti to attain Bhagavan, the three Bs. Bhaktas, performing bhakti, loving service to attain Bhagavan or to be, to attain love for the Supreme Lord, to get Krishna Prema. So join us tomorrow for a new adventure about who is the Supreme Lord and what can we learn about him? Where does he live? What is his address? How do we find him? What does he want us to do? How do we serve him? What pleases him most? All of this we will discover tomorrow at 8 o'clock. Thank you very much for joining us.